Thank you, musicians. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to John chapter 11? I love it when the Lord orchestrates things together. Amen. So exciting just to be in church. There's something spectacular that only occurs when God's people gather together to worship him. That's a unique presence, a unique anointing, a unique dynamics that only happens when we gather together in God's house together to worship the Lord together and to receive the word of God together. Amen. So good. Those watching online, we pray that you are blessed. Those who are not able to be here, um, we are praying that you will sense the presence of the Holy Spirit right there where you are. Amen. Praise the Lord. We had a few in our church that are not doing, feeling well. And Brother Sanchez, family, we're praying for you. Say hi to the kids. Praise the Lord. I know they're watching this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. John chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Then we're going to fast forward to verses 38 and 40. John chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. If you have it, say amen. Amen. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, He whom you love is sick. Then Jesus, when Jesus heard of that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, fast forward to verse 38 through 40. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Verse 40. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Amen. Let us pray. Father, we, 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 we love you this morning, the Sunday after Easter, two Sundays after Pump Sunday. What a beautiful day it is today. The sun is out. The weather is just right. Texas is doing a good job today. The blue bonnets are raging in Brenham and throughout Texas. But more importantly, Lord, more importantly, is that we uh, are reminded today that you still love us. You are still in control. You're still on the throne. You're still in charge. You are still on the job. Father, I pray that right now you would just anoint these lips of clay that you may grant your servant an anointing to preach the word of God this morning, that you may just grant us uh, the ability to apprehend and comprehend the word of God this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen and amen. This morning I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to preach, 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 and I, 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 Felt impressed this week to preach on this passage, but not necessarily the way that uh, maybe you think it will come across. But I felt impressed by the Spirit of God to talk about something in this story that oftentimes we skip over. Let me start by saying this. That the most important theme in the entire universe... It's the glory of God. 
the glory of God. That's the most important headline in the universe. The glory of God is who he is. The glory of God is what he requires. The glory of God is the reason all creation was created. Now, when I use the word glory, let me explain what that is. The Hebrew word for glory defines glory as heaviness or weight. It is one word that describes a wide range of meaning. It expresses the splendor, the greatness, the honor, and the power of God. It expresses the dazzling brightness of God's own person and presence, the glory of God. Throughout the Bible, you see a glimpse of the glory of God. You and I were designed not to be able to see the entire glory. You remember the story. Moses said, let me see your glory. God said, you can't handle 100% of my glory. I tell you what, hide inside that cleft of that rock and I'll give you a glimpse. And he hit there and God walked by and put his hand on the cliff, on, on that cleft, on that crevice and walked by and so that Moses can see just a glimpse because he's not able to see the entire glory. The glory of God. God is glorious. Amen. That's something we, uh, that, that churches don't comprehend now. They, they don't get it. They use that word. We use that word glory, glory, hallelujah. It's the glory of God. What is glory? God is glorious. God not only has glory, he is glory. He, glory is who he is. The Bible tells us that, calls him the God of glory. The Bible calls him the king of glory. John 1.14 says, and the word, speaking of Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Jesus is the glory of God and a size and a package that we are able to handle. The glory of God packaged in flesh. There's a story in the Bible that Jesus went up the mountain, the mountain of transfiguration. He took three of his disciples and there for a few moments, the glory was unwrapped and they were able to see the glory of God inside Jesus. We beheld his glory. And that moment Jesus was revealing himself inside out. The 100% God was in full display. God's intrinsic glory is totally his. And God will not share his glory with anyone. Not even the angels of heaven. He won't share his glory. God deserves and requires glory. And I'm, I'm setting you up. You're saying, what does this have to do with Lazarus? I'll connect the dots. But I, I need to treat you, treat you this morning about this. God deserves and requires glory. He is glory. He requires glory. That's the main purpose of all creation. The main purpose of creation is to give him glory. Psalms 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. What does that mean? That the sun, the moon, the stars, the Milky Way, declares the glory of God. You cannot study space and universe and the planets without realizing there has to be a designer. There has to be someone greater. The Grand Canyon, Mount Everest, Niagara Falls, all declare the glory of God. When you go snorkeling, when you go gliding, when you go ziplining, all oh, declares the glory of God. Nature and creation declares the glory of God. This week, my wife was not feeling well, and, and she needed to get out of the house, so I said, let's go and let's just drive and, and see, how, see how you feel. Let's just go and drive to Brenham, Texas, and look at the blue bonnets. 
And we got on Highway 290. As we got closer, there they were, the blue bonnets. The blue bonnets. Oh, my goodness. That's, that's, Texas has the best blue bonnets. If you haven't done the blue bonnet thing, you have to. If you've been in Texas and haven't done that, then you are cheating yourself. You drive to Branham, Texas, and you see the blue bonnets there, full display, and it reminded us that God needs to be glorified. He displays the blue bonnet so that you can say, oh my God, how beautiful it is. There must be a God, hallelujah. Then we got to Branham, she was feeling, she was still feeling a little, Okay, and we said, well, if we want to experience the, blue, the, the, the presence of God, let's get some bluebell ice cream. <laughs> the human body, for you that love to study biology, when you study the human body, the skeleton, the muscles, the digestive system, the nervous system, it declares the glory of God. In other words, when you study Adam, humanity, it declares the glory of God. And when you study the atom and the protons and the neurons, it declares the glory of God. All creation was designed by God to declare the glory of God. Everything God created gives him glory except fallen angels and fallen men. Lucifer was one of the greatest angels in heaven. He wanted to share the glory. He wanted to hijack some of God's glory and pride into him. And as a result, he was evicted from heaven, him and one third of the angels. And they became evil, not just had evil, they became evil. See, you have to understand, angels are not made in the image of God like man is. It's not the same. I'm not going to go there right now, but it's not the same. Man was created by God to glorify God, not just to praise and worship but in a different way than everybody else and anything else, man was created to glorify God through fellowship with God. Amen. Through the fellowship with God, but because of sin, this fellowship was broken and man was not able to glorify God in the fellowship, in the fellowship with God. However, God's glory is seen in redemption. Romans 9.23 tells us, that God saves sinners. He saves sinners to make known the riches of his glory upon the vessels of mercy which he, which he prepared beforehand for glory. God saved, redeemed, redeemed man. That in itself demonstrates his glory so that we can be back in the place to give him glory and our praise and in, in, in our adoration and in our fellowship so that we can smell like Christ. We've been saved. So the question is this, though, Pastor Cortez, how then can, how do we give glory to God? God is glory. He requires glory. Creation gives him glory. We are designed to give him glory. How do we give him glory? We give him glory through everything we do and everything we say. And we give him glory through in our life experience, the things we go through. We give God glory by allowing him to be glorified through our triumphs and through our tragedies. That's what I wanted to bring you to. We give glory, praise, adoration, but we give glory in our life during the highs and the lows. Oh, we want to give God glory through the triumphs. 
That's why we pray for, Lord, use me. We sing that song, you can use anything, Lord, you can use me, which means if you want to use me to preach the gospel to a million people at one time, I'm available. I'm available. But what if God is saying, I want to use you in your tragedies, during your tragedies. I want to use you during the worst moments of your life. I had one amen. That's not something we like to amen. But if we withhold that from God, if we say, God, we want to glorify you through our triumphs, through our praise and adoration, our songwriting, but not through our tragedies, then you and I have not fully surrendered. When you fully surrender, you're saying, God, in whatever way you choose, to be glorified. I may not understand why, but I trust you and I obey you. I yield to you, I surrender all to you. This was the case of Lazarus. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. Mary Martha, when they send a note that he was sick, Lazarus whom you love. See, in our minds, we think that Jesus was hanging out with Martha and Mary, but then Lazarus was in the man cave. No, Jesus had a close relationship with all three. Mary, Martha glorified God through her serving. Mary glorified God by her sitting. But Lazarus glorified God through his suffering. Lazarus had communicated to Jesus, if you want to be glorified through my life in any way, you don't even have to explain it to me. I'm available. I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to sing. I don't know how to write songs. But if you want to use my life to be glorified in any way, Lord, I'm available. And Jesus took note. I'm looking for people that are willing to allow me to use their lives, the good, the bad, and the ugly, in any way, to bring me glory. And we know the story, Lazarus died. We know the story that he was resurrected by Christ four days after he died. We know that story. But the main purpose of this spectacular miracle of Lazarus being risen from the dead after four days of being in a tomb. The main purpose of this incident was not the, resurrect, was not the resurrecting of the dead Lazarus, but the main purpose was the glorifying of the living God. That's the main thing. It wasn't that he ran out of the grave, which he actually bounced out of the grave. It was the glorifying of God. See, Jesus loved Lazarus so much and Lazarus loved him so much that Jesus chose the worst tragedy that Lazarus had experienced thus far to bring him glory. This event of the death and resurrection of Lazarus staged the greatest glorification on earth of Christ Jesus that earth has ever seen. It, it didn't just bring in glory like, oh, wow, Jesus, you're awesome. But it staged the greatest glorification that Jesus was given on earth. And what is that? The greatest glorification is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The death of Lazarus and his resurrection staged the greatest glorification. That's why Jesus sent the message, this is not unto the sickness, it's not unto death, it's, un, it's unto, my, it's unto uh, the glorification of me. It's to, unto my glorification of God and of myself. Now when you use the word staging, what do you mean, Pastor Cortez? Well, staging is the preparation for a grand event. 
If you ever been to a parade, now I went, I've been to a lot of parades in New York City on Fifth Avenue, but also small town. When we live in a small town, we had a parade. I remember because I was raising big parades and you got up at six in the morning, you went downtown, you, you, you got your place, you, sit, you wait, wait there for hours. And then the Macy's Day Parade and we saw that, we experienced that, Ooh, you know. And uh, so we, we were living in a small town, Crockett, Texas, pastoring there. And had a parade. I forgot what Christmas was. Christmas? It was Christmas. I said, man, let's get up early. Let's get up early. And the people, you know, let's get up early. I want to get a good spot. We got up early. We went there. And, and it was, uh, it's a little town. It's a little square. And we got there. And we got our lawn chairs. We sat there. And then the parade started. And there was a fire engine and three cars and, 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 and two horses. And that was it. I mean, it was like five minutes. Well, that's it. Let's go home. I said, all these people came here for that? I was expecting balloons and, you know, marching bands. But the fire truck was there, shiny. But one thing that was interesting about all parades, including the one in Crockett, Texas, was the staging that all the props, all the cars, all the trucks, all the people would be in the off street preparing for the parade, the preparation for the big parade, the practice, the horns, the cars, the people in their uniforms. It's the staging. It's called the staging. And then the timing. You, you, want, to, you want to start the parade at a certain time, just when, everyone, when you have a full house. It's the staging. And here in this story, this event... The, the death and the resurrection of Lazarus was the, the staging of a future even bigger event. And that is the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Hallelujah. So as I studied this, the Lord revealed to me um, four stages that God uh, uh, performs in our lives. Four ways God stages our lives to bring him the utmost glory. And this morning, you may be experiencing one, two, three, or all four. As God's preparing your life for a staging of using your life to glorify him. Hallelujah. The first way that he stages is staged by declaring. Staged by declaring. Verse 4 says... Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death, but the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. That's important to know. He made a declaration. Let me tell you what that means to you and for me. That God will not tell us what we want to hear, but but what he wants us to hear. Let me say that again. Some of you didn't get it. You you guys didn't get it. I got an amen here. God won't tell you what you want to hear. He will tell you what he wants you to hear. That's how God works. And God is always declaring to us his word. He's always telling us things to prepare us, to use us. The problem is that we don't like what He is saying all the times, oh, we don't fully believe it. It sounds too spiritual. Jesus sent a word. This this sickness is not unto death. That did not mean that Lazarus was not going to die. It simply meant that the death would not have the last word. This sickness is... Unto the glory of God, it will glorify God. In other words, the healing, that the glorification of Christ was not going to happen through the healing. It was going to happen through a, restu- happen through a resurrection. A resurrection like none other. What do you mean? Prior to this, people in the Bible that were raised from the dead were all raised within moments of them dying. 
Lazarus was going to be raised from the dead. Not one, not two, not three. Four days after he died. I'm not a medical person, but I understand that someone drops dead. I hope it doesn't happen this morning. But someone drops dead. You could do some CPR. Boom, 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 boom. Get the shot. Boom, 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 boom. You know? And they come back to life. That doesn't work in four days. You could try the electrical shock and pump, pump, pump. Someone who's been dead four days, it's not going to happen. So the resurrection of someone that's been dead for four days, that was big time. And the Lord declared that. See, sometimes God declares to you and I a word. And at first it sounds wonderful, but then it doesn't match the circumstances. And we want the Lord, you gave me this word, but the circumstances seem to contradict it. The word is that this death, this was not going to bring to death, but yet it's late. He's dying. He's died. See, what happens is this. Sometimes we, we, we think that the word that God has given to us, that it, that it is a special word. We think that the word has an expiration. Have you ever, have you, have you ever gone to re- the refrigerator? I love my, I, I love my latte with whole milk, none of that skim milk. I, give me the fat grams. I'm into fat grams this morning, bluebell and then fat grams, right? And have, and this has happened to me. I, I do my espresso, I get it set up, and I go to the fridge, I take the milk out. It's expired. Well, sometimes you can still use it, right? But I have, I, ooh. It stinketh. <laughs> See, sometimes we treat the word that God has given us, we assume it has an expiration because maybe we face a circumstance after he gave us a word that almost seems to contradict the word that he's given us. Amen. But let me tell you something about the word of God. Listen carefully. The word of God, God always is speaking through his precious word and the word that God gives us is forever settled in heaven. The Bible is settled in heaven. It's like the cloud, everything's on a cloud. Now all your information on your computer is on a cloud. Forget the hard drive, it's on a cloud. It's settled in heaven forever. The Bible tells us that his word never returns void. In other words, it always accomplishes what it was sent to do. The word of God is like an arrow shot by God, and that arrow will hit the target. It may not hit the target at the time you thought it should, but it will always hit the target because the word of God never returns void. Hallelujah. In other words, if he said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he will bring it to pass. Someone praise the Lord. The Bible tells us that God is not like man. God is not a liar. God is not a liar. And we know this, but when he gives us a word and then the circumstances seem to have gone beyond it, Subconsciously, we start doubting the word of God. We think that certain parts of this Bible has expired. It is too late. But God often starts the staging of using your life and my life to glorify him through a word that he declares. The second way that God stages our lives for his glorification. And this is the one you're not going to like. I'm telling you right now, you're not going to like this one. You're not going to amen me. Amen? Stage by delaying. Verse 6, so when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, Jesus stayed two more days in the place where he was. I don't get it. Jesus, 
Your friend is dying. Drop everything and rush over. He stayed two more days. Four days. And if you do the math, it makes sense. One day for the messenger to bring the message to Jesus. Two days he remains. That's one, two, three. One day for Jesus to travel to Bethany. Four days. Jesus, he's, he's dead four days, which means that by the time the messenger first brought the message to Jesus, by the time he arrived, Lazarus was dead already. Have you done the math? Is it too early in the morning for you? One day to travel, two days stay, one extra day to go back, one, two, three, four, Jesus arrives, he's been dead four days. Jesus is always one step ahead. He knows what's happening. He, he's on top of circumstances more than we are. Hallelujah. Staged by the delay. Here's the point. Jesus may not show up when you want him to, but he's always on time. I said, he may not show up on day number one. He may show up on day number four. And you may think day number four is too late, but day number four is me. It's the day that he's on time. He always is on time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that Jesus says he has made everything beautiful in his time. He will glorify, be glorified through your life in his time. Lord, you need to do it right. You know, you know I mean, I've been sick for a while. I, you need Hurry up before it gets worse. Whenever he chooses to do it, it will be at the right time. Oh, listen to this one. In Genesis 21, 2, it tells us that Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time. God had promised them a child. She waited for many, 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 many years. She was barren already. And at the age of 90, I can't I think doing this again. <laughs> but at the age of 90, she had a baby bump. She was taking selfies. At the age of 90, the Bible says, Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in, her, in his old age at the set time. It wasn't like God said, oops, oh, I, forgot to I forgot to make you pregnant. <laughs> I might as well do it now. No. It was at the exact timing that God had planned. Why? Because at the age of 90, her having a baby would be a, an incredible miracle and it would give God the glory. Hallelujah. At the set time. Lazarus was on his deathbed when Jesus, when the message was sent to Jesus. And when Jesus arrived, he was dead four days already. And you say, so why... Why the delay? There's a reason. There's a reason for everything God does or doesn't do. I'm here. To, there's a reason for everything God does and doesn't do. Amen. See, He delayed the parade of glory. He delayed coming because during day one, when Lazarus was sick, he just had a few people in the house. When he died, more people came to the house from the town. And after he died, the Jewish custom, they do something called Shiva. I was raised in a lot of Jewish people, and I know this. And the phrase is called sitting Shiva. Sitting Shiva is when, in the Jewish culture, when someone dies, family members they sit with each other in the house dressed in black for seven days. 
And then afterwards, they have an entire month of, of modified grieving. During those first seven days, outside relatives and family and neighbors, you come and show your respects. At, at Shiva is done in the house after the person, the loved one has been buried. And during Shiva, family and friends, they come and they come to pay their respects, bring a little food, but sit with the family and just mourn with the family. So Shiva, there was no Shiva when he was sick. Shiva started after he died and was buried. When more people came to the house, not just from Bethany, but then the Bible says Jewish people or the leadership from Jerusalem two miles away, because Lazarus was probably a mover and a shaker, his family. They were, high, they were in great high respect. Jews traveled all the way, two miles, to the house to sit with the family, to, 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 to sit Shiva, to mourn with the family. The house is full. To, that, that would not have happened had Jesus shown up. Had Jesus shown up when he was sick, it would have been, what, 12 people? But when he showed up, what, 1,200 or 120? I don't know, but a lot more people. In other words, Jesus delayed because he wanted more people in the parade to watch a parade. He delayed because he wanted them to see, to see his glory in a way they would not have seen it. And not only did they, more people saw it, what they saw was not a miracle of healing. They saw a miracle of someone that was dead one, two, three, four days. He staged uh, the events by his delay. When he delays working in your life, it's not because he had so many things to do on his bucket list and you're down at a totem pole. His delay is orchestrated so that when he shows up, he can have the greatest glory through your tragedy, through your pain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. His delay was to allow a larger crowd to be in Bethany, to witness not just the glorification that will occur through the resurrection of Lazarus, but the staging of his future resurrection. When Lazarus rose from the dead, after four days, he was decomposing already. I know, you don't want to hear this before you go to the Olive Garden, but you need to hear this. <laughs> he, was, he was just being held together by bandages. It was like, not just dead, but too late. He was falling apart, too late. But Jesus, when everyone said it was too late, he was at the right time. Third way, stage by deploying. Verse 14 and 15, Lazarus is dead. This is Jesus speaking. Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. At that point, no, he, he ain't sick. He is dead. We, we got to go. We got to go. See, sometimes you got to go. Sometimes you have to plow through doubt and resistance and what others consider bad timing. Sometimes you have to plow through, plow through the doubt and resistance of even close friends and family in order to glorify God in your life. Sometimes when you decide to, I'm going to, I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going to pursue what he's called me. Sometimes the greatest resistance you have is not demonic resistance. It's fr friends and family that love you. They mean well, but they tell, hey, Jesus, you don't want to go now. Jesus, if he's, if Jesus, if he's asleep, because Jesus said early, he's asleep. If he's asleep, you'll wake up. And Jesus said, like, I got to, let me shoot straight. He's dead. And then they said, Jesus, if he's dead, you don't want to, why bother? He's dead. 
for is he's dead for a while. And Jesus, if you go back to the area, Bethany, two miles from Jerusalem, those Jewish people, been, there's been some chatter. There's been some, some Twitter. There's been some Facebook. There's been some chatter. They want to kill you. They want to kill all of us. We love you too much to let you die. Thomas said, Jesus, we love you too much to let you die. What? I'm going. I'm still going. Thomas said, we'll go with you. Let us go so we could die with him. What a mixture of love for Jesus and doubt of his word. Do you get this? I love Jesus a lot, but he's going to kill himself. What a combination of love for Jesus and doubt of who he is. See, a lot of times that's what happens to us. We say we love Jesus. We come to church. We read the Bible. We love him with all our hearts. There's certain songs that we sing and we cry. But we doubt his word. We doubt what he said. We have confused sentiment with conviction with the word of God. Thomas is such a person. And had Jesus not been determined, he would say, you know what, I don't, want, I, I don't want to rattle your cage. We'll go at another time. I, I, we'll, post, we'll postpone this trip. But Jesus faced doubt and resistance from the start of his parade. It's, a, it's amazing when God calls you to do something and then you face doubt. Here's a story. You may have heard this. Our Spanish language pastor, Pastor Rene Perez, for those who are visiting, we have a Spanish language church that meets right now at the same time. And we have a small chapel that looks like this room, a lot smaller. And he's been pastoring there for the past 10 years. And we, he does a great job. How many of you know, know Brother Rene and appreciate what he does? Does a great job. So here's the, here's the story. Pastor Rene, who is an engineer, um, when we first came to this church, he started putting things in place. He stepped up to the plate. He, was, he started attending about the same time we did, and maybe a few months earlier. And we wanted to reactivate our Royal Ranger Boys Discipleship Ministry. And he had been involved with that ministry. And he uh, stepped in and took over that ministry and did a great job. And I appreciate that. And my mind was to someone raised in church. He loves boys and did a good job. And then... Um, Um, The Spanish ministry we had here um, had to be restarted, and uh, there were some changes, and we were just having having, um, um, Sunday school, but really we we were looking for a pastor. And uh, during the time, uh, my wife comes to me and says, you know what? I was walking by the Royal Rangers the other day, and Brother brother Rene, he was preaching. I said, no, you mean he was exhorting. No, no, he was preaching. He was preaching with an anointing to those boys. He has a call in his life to preach. Say what? Yeah, he does. Really? And, and, and we need someone to do our Spanish church ministry. So we took them, him and Sister Esther, to eat. And we sat there and I kind of shared my heart about the Spanish ministry and so forth. And I said, Pastor Rene, I don't know, I don't want to spook you. I don't know what's happening, but my wife tells me that she heard you preach. You weren't just exhorting the kids. You were preaching to those kids. There was a special anointing. And I suspect there's something there. I don't know. I don't want to trick you into doing something, but I suspect there's something there. And, um, and then the man began to cry over the tortilla chips. <laughs> began to, what's wrong? And he just, Brother Cortez, I have a calling in my life to preach. You do? He said, let me share a story I have never told anybody. He said, when I was, you know, I was raised in the valley. I was raised in a Christian home. And when I was 14 years old, God called me to preach. 
He called me to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I knew it. And I would get up in the morning and read my Bible. I would read my Bible at nighttime. I would go to church. I just, it, was, it, was a, it was a deployment. I was being deployed into the ministry. And I knew that God was calling me. But then one day, I was reading my Bible early in the morning, and I, and I just fell asleep. I, I fell asleep. And then I had a close relative, a doubter, wake me up and says, look at you, sleeping and reading the Bible, and you say you, you've been called by God to serve him. What kind of person are you? You're not called by God. And mocked him. And that resistance hit him so hard that at that point he decided, I'll serve the Lord in my own way, but I won't pursue the ministry. I'll pursue doing good in school. He went to school. He went to college, became an engineer. And did not plow through that doubt until that day that he shared with us. He said, you know what, it's never too late. I have a call in my life. He said, I'll pastor that church. I, I, I'm an engineer. I'll continue doing that, but I'll plow through. And he has stepped into that calling. He plowed through, and even though those memories were still lingering, those memories were still haunting him, he decided, you know what, I'm going to continue to follow the Lord. I'm not going to let the doubters and the haters cause me to stay parked. I have been deployed by God. Isn't that a wonderful story? Hallelujah. I, I just feel that as I share this with someone here, I, I think someone here, God has deployed you and you are, you, you are unwilling to go because of doubters and haters that have resisted you. Jesus faced doubters and haters and resistance from the very start of the parade, from the very beginning. I'm here to tell you once you get the green light from heaven and God has called you. God said, go for it. Pursue the call in your life. Once you get that green light and there's people around you, if the people are not supporting you, tell them, get on the bus or get off the bus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Hallelujah. I have, God has called me to serve him, to glorify him. And I'm not looking for friends as in Facebook friends, like, 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 like. You could unlike me, you could defend me. I don't care. I'm here to serve the Lord, whether you celebrate me or you don't celebrate me. I have a call of my God. I have been deployed. I've been parked for a while. Now the Lord says, go from park to, to, to drive and go for it. And I'm going to, I've been deployed. I'm going to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. And Jesus, upon the arrival, his arrival, to Bethany, Jesus encountered more resistance. When he arrived there, he told, uh, he arrived there, Martha tells him, Jesus, Jesus, he went, Jesus, Jesus, uh, uh, had you been here, uh, Lazarus would not have died, but I know whatever you say, whatever you say uh, it will happen. She really kind of push pull, Jesus, you're late but whatever. And Jesus said, you know, I'm not late. I am the, re the resurrection and the life. Uh, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And she said, yeah, 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 right, 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 right. I believe one day, one day in the future, she got very religious, one day in the future, he raised from the dead. And Jesus said, you don't understand. Uh, you don't understand. That's not how it works. Do you believe that I could raise him from the dead? And then she never answered him. She, she basically said, I believe you are the Christ. Of, you are the son of God. You know, it's amazing how we never answer the question. We give God the answer to the wrong question because we really don't believe. And at that point, Jesus could say, you know what? You're not working with me, Martha. Uh, and, and then Mary came later. You're not working with me. And, and all these people, all these people doing Shiva and mourning, they're not working with me. I, I, I can't do this. He was on assignment. And he went and pursued that assignment. Hallelujah. When he was surrounded by the mourners of the grave site, and, and one of them said, criti criticized, criticized Jesus and said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? I'm here to tell you that once God has deployed you, at that point you need to be like a smart missile. 
I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to do this assignment, whether I have people applauding me, whether I have people jeering at me, whether I have votes, whether I have uh, people dropping like flies, whether people get off the bus, I'm going to pursue what God has called me to do. Lastly, musicians, will you come? Stage by demanding. Verse 39, take away the stone. Sometimes you have to speak up with the authority you have in Christ and demand obstacles to move away so that God can be glorified. Sometimes you have, oh, but I'm, I'm bashful. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an introvert. Oh, I, I, I don't want to bring attention. Sometimes you have to put us, die to self, die to your introversion, die to your shyness. Sometimes you have to die to self and speak the word of God. And command, and com- and command those demonic forces to step back and call in the presence of God. You have to speak. Can someone say amen? Hallelujah. I've shared this story many times, how when I was nine years old, and you know the story, that my, I was raised mostly by my godly grandmother, but when I was nine years old, my mother tried to commit suicide, and I'm the one that found her. She had taken every pill uh, imaginable in the house in the medicine cabinet, and when I got there, and then my brother got there, we were weeping and crying, and then we contacted the neighbors. The neighbors came in, and they called the ambulance people. And I, 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 it was traumatic. Um, but God had spoken to my grandmother, who is, uh, was a prayer warrior, and she, God said, you need to go deploy now. <laughs> deploy now and she ran two three blocks from where she lived to our apartment in New York City and she came with her her Bible and her olive oil her Goya olive oil and she came in there and at that point it was all confusion I was crying my brother was crying uh, all the neighbors were standing around all the mourners were there doing Shiva already my mother I thought she was dead because she was not responsive and, and nothing was happening. And we could hear the siren come, police come in the siren, all this activity and coming up the stairs. And at that point, the woman of God, it, was, it wasn't just me, Abuelita. She was the woman of God. The woman of God got up. She went to the apartment with her olive oil. She had a big, she had a big, uh, 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 Godzilla Bible and a big purse but I, I don't remember the Bible I don't remember the purse I remember the Goya oil she took it out of her out of her uh, bottle out of her purse and she and she began to declare she told everyone stand back stand back stop crying tell the EMT hold that thought they're coming up God has sent me to declare something Now remember, she began to say, you shall not die, but live. She got on that bed. She began to speak in tongues. Folks, I said, I I would never forget this. Because in my mind was, she's another person. The authority in her. And she was speaking. She took in charge of everybody. She took my mother's head, tilted it backwards. She She didn't YouTube this. This is something the Holy Spirit told her to do. She tilted my mother's head backwards. She took the bottle of olive oil, poured it down her throat, speaking in tongues, quoting the scripture. And suddenly my mother began to convulse and she vomited all that junk out. I declare you delivered. Okay, guys, you can take her. I I, I would never forget that. And what I remember wasn't just the drama of the event. It's her taking charge with authority. See, some of you, when you go to someone's house and they're sick, and God sends you to go to someone's house and they're depressed, they're finding, they're fighting deep depression, and you're sent and God has sent you to go. I, I, I feel in my spirit, I need to tell someone this. And once the hospital's open, 
God may send you to visit somebody in the hospital. At that point, you need to show up as the man of God or the woman of God. Stop showing up like, uh, 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 can, I, can I read your Bible verse? No, 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 no. At that point, well, I don't want to bring attention to myself. Forget you. Die to self. When you show up, you show up like the man of God, the woman of God. You show up with, thus says the Lord. You go to their, someone's house and they're depressed, fighting, fighting demonic oppression. And God sent you there. God did not send you there to, be, to perform therapy. Or just encourage. God sent you there to be the man of God, the woman of God. You go in there. You open up the shades. Let the light in. You take your Bible and say, thus says the Lord. I command darkness to leave this mind, this spirit, this life. And I speak joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And you begin to declare the word of God. Hallelujah. Well, I'm not a reverend. I'm not a preacher like you, like Sister Rebecca. You don't have to be a reverend. You need the Holy Ghost and the Word of God. You go and you declare. Hallelujah. You, you declare the Word of God. Sometimes you just have to speak up with authority that you have in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus went there and spoke up. Move away the stone. It wasn't like, do you mind moving the stone? I don't want to offend. Move the stone. Roll the stone away. And there was something about his tone. But Martha said, uh, Jesus, guys, hold up here. Because as the oldest member of the family, she was the one to give the green light, okay? So they all looked at her. Should I? She goes, Jesus, he smells. I want to be discreet. Trying to, you know, you, you notice how we're trying to be discreet with body language and words. Like he's falling apart. I mean, He's just being held together by tape. But then she realized he was speaking with authority. Roll the stone. And she realized it's that, oh, it's that tone of authority. And she told the boys. And they rolled that stone away after four days. And everyone's like, He spoke with authority. Then he spoke again with authority. Lazarus, come forth. The reason he said Lazarus, because had he said, come forth, everybody else would have been coming out. And in the original Greek, Lazarus come forth is very abrupt. Lazarus, here, now. That's really the translation. Lazarus, here, now, with authority. Lazarus, here, now. And he came out bouncing. And then he gave another word. Loose him and let him go. Now that was heavy because they were Jews. In the Jewish culture and religion, you were not allowed to touch a dead body. You were not allowed to touch, especially a decomposing body. Because if you touch something dead, then therefore you became unclean. They had all these rules and regulations. The man you said, don't touch. I know that he's bouncing, but those still are grave clothes. That's what the man you said. Loose him and let him go. Don't you be constrained by your doubt and your religion and your rules. 
when I speak that trumps anything else, you lose him and you let him go. You touch the miracle. You handle the miracle. You wrap the miracle. You need to experience my glory by handling it yourselves. He declared it. When he said, loose him and let him go, he was saying, let this miracle glorify me like no one has ever done before. Let this miracle stage a greater glorification. Because not long after, the, after that, when he died, they remember Lazarus. When he rose from the dead, they remembered uh, Martha didn't get the green light to move the stone. Who moved the stone? An angel showed up from heaven. An angel moved the stone and then sat on it. Hey. Who unwrapped Jesus? No one unwrapped him. He left the wrappings in the tomb. It was a greater miracle than even Lazarus. He was glorified in his death and in his resurrection and in his ascension. He was glorified. The death and resurrection of Lazarus was the staging of this greater miracle that happened. Would you stand? Verse 45 and 46 of John 11 says, after the resurrection of Lazarus, then many of the Jews who had come to Mary from Jerusalem, remember them, they came to do Shiva, and had seen the things Jesus did, believed in him. They would have never believed in Jesus had they not come to, Beth, to Bethany and they would have not come to Bethany had Lazarus not died. Verse 46, but some of these Jews went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. And then verse 53, from that day, they plotted to put him to death. From that day, they officially had a plan to crucify Jesus. Before it was just chatter. But the death and resurrection of Lazarus brought many people to the Lord and they believe in him. But those that chose not to believe, they began to officially plan the death, the crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ, which was the beginning of the greatest glorification event the earth had ever experienced. Lazarus, Lord, use me in whatever way. You know, Lazarus, I'm going to use your tragedy to bring me glory, not just in the miracle, but to stage the biggest miracle earth has ever seen, my death and my resurrection. For I rose my, I'm going to raise, raise myself from the dead, unlike everybody else. Your event is just a preview of the greatest event earth has ever witnessed. Christ's resurrection was even more glorious than the resurrection of Lazarus. For the stone was moved by an angel. The grave clothes remained inside the tomb. His ascension to heaven after 40 days walking the earth speaking about the kingdom of God. His ascension to heaven was dazzling and glorious and breathtaking. And the outpouring of his Holy Spirit was glory that came down in a whole different way. This morning I'm here to remind you this, that God wants to be glorified through your life. But once you start giving God limits, how he can be glorified to your life, you're not surrendered. He cannot use you. 
You can't say, use me and my triumphs, but not my tragedies. You can't, you can't pick and choose. This is not Luby's buffet line you can pick and choose. It's the entire thing or not. But if you're saying, Jesus, I love you so much and I trust you, I trust your word, I surrender and use me in whatever way. And when he begins to use you in whatever way, to trust him even when people don't agree with you or doubt or resist you. Not just enemies, but loving doubters. Thomas loved Jesus, but doubted Jesus. I think that's the trickiest one, loving doubters. People that love you, but they doubt that God really wants to be glorified to your life. That's a tricky one. Because you, I, I don't want to offend family. Hey, blood is thicker in the water. And Jesus said, that's right, blood is thicker in the water. My blood is thicker than your water. My blood is thicker than your ethnic pride or nationality or whatever it is. Family ties. But when you come to that, like Lazarus, we always do a big thing. Martha, Martha said, she served. She was a good cook. She served. And then Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, worshiped him, broke the alabaster box. We always kind of write off Lazarus. But man, Lazarus was the one that Jesus trusted to set him up for the greatest glorification event ever. Because Lazarus was, yeah, I can't sing. I don't cook. I don't know how to, I, how to write songs. But I'm, if you can use my life in anything, I'm willing. Jesus said, you know what? I'll take you. I'll, I'll take you on that. And did. Every head bow, every eye closed. This morning, I, I, I know that God led me to treach this morning. It was not just about the resurrection but it was greater. It's, a, it's about bringing God glory. This morning you're saying, Pastor Cortez, God has reminded me this morning that if I cannot trust him through trials and tribulations and tragedies, then I don't have it, I don't have it together. Pastor Cortez, pray that the Holy Spirit will help me surrender. To trust God in anything and in everything. Not just in the trials and not just in the triumphs, but also in the tragedies. That if God wants to use something very difficult to bring Him glory, I trust Him enough that He's not going to drop the ball. Regardless of what happens, I still I will trust Him. Still I will obey Him. I want to listen to His voice and respond to his call. If that's you this morning, you're saying, Pastor Cortez, I want God to use me in any way he chooses, any way. And he doesn't have to give me a preview. He doesn't have to give me a FYI advance notice. I don't need the details. I hear him saying to me, I want to be glorified through your life. And I just want to be able to grab that and run with it because I trust him. I may not understand everything or his timing or his method, but I love him. If that's you this morning, Pastor Cortez, that's me. Can you pray for me? Would you raise your hand right now? Yes, yes. Oh, look at that. Yes. Anyone else? Yes, yes. Hallelujah. You can put your hands down. That's all, he, that, that's all he's asking, our surrender. We think, oh, God just wants to use... Uh, dynamite people. They know how to cook and sing and dance and preach. And God said, no, I, I want to use regular people like Lazarus. Just regular people like Lazarus. He used a regular person like Lazarus to stage the greatest glorification earth had ever seen. Not just the resurrection of Lazarus, but the future death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness. With every head bow, your eye closed. If there's anyone here, you're saying, I, I am not right with God. I love him, but I'm not right with him. I am not right with him. And I want to be right with him. And the reason I haven't been right with him is because I don't understand certain things. And I realize I, I, can't, I can't figure things. I cannot figure out heaven. I could only embrace heaven. And I want to surrender. Either a first time or a rededication to the Lord. You, this morning, if that's you, would you signify by the raising your hand quickly? 
할렐루야 할렐루야 Father right now I thank you for this message I thank you for reminding us about the greatest story ever told Father I thank you that you have reminded us that the reason we were created and the reason we live is to glorify you to bring you glory but not just to bring you glory in the way we choose and we're comfortable with but in the way that you choose you never ask us are we comfortable with doing certain things that will bring you glory Lord that's not how you work it's not about our comfort it's, it is about our surrender And Lord, this morning, Lord, I pray that our church will be a church filled with people that are surrendered to you. Whatever you ask us to do, we'll do. Wherever you tell us to go, we'll go. And when you say go, we go. And when you tell us stay, we stay. And when you, when you tell us be quiet, we, we are quiet. When you tell us to speak up and declare, we will declare. And Father, I pray right now, Lord, if, they, if you spoke to somebody today and they know somebody that needs deliverance, they need A, a word from the Lord. Father, I pray that in our humility we may go in the authority of Christ. In our humility and in the authority of Christ. That's not a contradiction. In our humility and in the authority of Christ that we may go, Lord, speak the word, lay hands to whatever it is you have called us to do. Thus says the Lord. As the man of God, as the woman of God, we don't always have to call one of the pastors of the church, Lord. We have the same Holy Spirit. We have the same word. And Father, I pray that we may just go Lord, I, I feel that someone here today, Lord, that you've been speaking to them and they've been hesitant. They've been waiting for you to call somebody else because they feel very, um, very unqualified uh, and very hesitant. But Father, I pray that, that we may die to self, even in that shyness, even in that hesitancy, that we may die to self and we may march on in the authority that is in Christ, declaring the glory of God, declaring the word of God and speak Thus says the Lord to that person, Lord, whatever that is, we may go speak to the Lord. Lord, our job is not to deliver. Our job is to present the word of God. You are the deliverer. You are the healer. You are the ones that will cast darkness out of light. But we are your heralds. We are your proclaimers. And Father, I pray that we may just begin to die to self and speak your word speak in authority Lord even today I send someone here today Lord today they need to go home change and get in the car and go to their house and speak the word of God in love and in authority hallelujah you have called us and in that way Lord we are ministers of the gospel we are proclaimers of the gospel heralds of the gospel Father that we may do it out of obedience and love for you Lord, we thank you. Oh, God, I, I, just, Lord, I, I just sense there's people here today that you have prompted them. You are prompting them from getting up from the reclining chair. You are prompting them to pursuing the call of God. You are prompting them to speak the word of God. You are prompting them to go to a specific person. And thus says the Lord, Father, whether they reject or accept that's not our duty. Lord, like you, like you spoke to the prophet Ezekiel, you told Ezekiel, you go speak the word of God, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they will know a prophet has spoken. You told him to go, thus says the Lord. And you told Ezekiel, Ezekiel, if you go and says, thus says the Lord, and they choose to repent, wonderful. If they choose not to repent, the blood is not on your hand. But if I've called you to speak the truth, Truth, and you chose not to speak because of whatever reason and if they are, are succumb to evil and wickedness and they go to hell the blood is on your hands and Father we don't want the blood on our hands so Father I pray that we may go in the authority of Christ thus says the Lord our job is not to deliver our job is not to heal our job is not to save our job is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaim truth in the authority that we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray that we may do that, not be bashful or shy about it, that we may die to self. Hallelujah. I just sense that strongly. I don't know who you are, but the Lord is, is telling you, get, stop being parked. You are being deployed. Deployed and declare. 
in the name of Jesus. It's not about you. What are they going to say? God's telling somebody, it's not about you and your reputation. It's about me and my reputation, my word. We are the body of Christ. That's not just a cliche. That means that we do the work of the Lord. Hallelujah. There's someone in your life that God wants to resurrect from the dead. And God wants to use you. God wants to use you. Someone needs to be resurrected from depression, resurrected from sickness, resurrected from, from sin and wickedness and bondage and lies and deceit in the minds. And God wants to use you. Quickly, if that's you and God has given you an assignment, I'm going to pray for you before we leave, right? Quickly, quickly, quick. If that's you, step outside, step from the aisle, come to the front. God has given you an assignment, thus says the Lord. God wants to use you. You know what the assignment is. You know who it's for. Quickly, come to the front. I want to pray for you. Quickly, stand here. Just make sure you're apart from each other, but come here. I want to pray for you. You're saying, Lord, I'm going to do this. Not because, uh, not because of pressure, not because of whatever reason. I'm going to do this because I love you. I'm under assignment. I'm under assignment. God wants to use you. And listen, God, God will help you with the details. He will help you with the words. As someone once told us in ministry, God will help you with the dynamics. Don't worry about the script of what to say in the time. God will help you with the details. He just wants your availability. Anybody else? God's been speaking to you, speaking to you about declaring, speaking forth the word of God. And you know that, you know without a doubt that God has called you. You don't know how, you don't know the details, but you know. Anyone else? Hallelujah. Father, these people are standing here, Lord. You took this message, Lord, and you kind of redirected it in a very specific way. And Father, you are speaking to people here today, Lord. These people that are stepping forward, they have an assignment. I may not know the assignment. I, I don't need to know the assignment. But they know the assignment. They know the location. They know the person they need to go. They know what to say. And Father, I pray right now that you will give them the unction for the function. In Jesus' name, Lord, you will help them. The Holy Spirit will help them with the details. The how and the why's. And, and the approach, you will help them with the details. Right now, Lord, you're simply looking for their obedience and their yieldingness in Jesus' name, Father. Lord, I pray they will leave this place with a purpose, with a deployment, with a deployment to speak the word of God and be able to say, thus says the Lord, and demand the stone to remove. Loose him and let him go, Father. I pray they may speak not their words, but the words of the Holy Spirit in them. Hallelujah. You have called us to be representatives of the kingdom of God. You have called us to be representatives of Christ Jesus. The gospel of Jesus Christ, we preach it and we do it. We preach it and we do it. And I pray that you would use each and every one person. Father, I pray for everyone here right now in the audience, everyone watching online, Father. We have sensed the moving of the Holy Spirit in a very specific direction this morning. And Father, I pray that we may walk and walk and march in authority and in confidence in Jesus. I pray a blessing upon each person here today, here in Family Life Assembly of God, watching online, everyone in Casa de Vida, our children's and ch in children's church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Love one another. We'll see you Wednesday night in church. God bless you. Amen. <laughs>